So uh, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we just thank you again for the opportunity that we have to come together and study your word and help us to be able to retain the things we learn, be able to share them with others. And most of all, may they impact our lives in a personal way that will draw us closer and closer to you. For to you, know you and your son is indeed life eternal. And to this end, we thank you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, as we begin, I want to do a little background here because this is an important part of Acts, the conversion of Paul. So let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Paul is definitely, he's the dominant figure in the book of Acts. I mean, three quarters of the book is, is uh, focused on him. And he, by birth, he's a Jew, of course. He's a Hellenistic Jew, like Stephen. He was very familiar with uh, Greek culture and the Greek language. He's a citizen of Rome, and that has its advantages as well. Tarsus is a big city. Uh, if I remember right, it's like, for, you know, big city. And back in the day, it, it was over 150,000. And, and it was one of the centers of learning. It would be like... Uh, our equivalent of, uh, say, a Yale University or, or Stanford or something like that. And it was located between what is now present day Turkey and Syria. And uh, tent making was a common industry in the city. And so Paul, at a, at, since every young man would, you know, Jewish young boy would have to learn a trade, it's most likely this is where he learned his trade growing up in Tarsus. He would learn how to take goat's hair and weave them into strips of material. And then somebody else would take those strips of material and, and sew them into tents. So you don't see this idea of him grab, you know, hauling along big uh, things of material. Now he would just have, you know, maybe a, a pack or something that he would carry and uh, would contain the goat's hair and he'd weave it and he'd sell those, those pieces. But on his bar mitzvah, his father was probably a Pharisee. And so at his bar mitzvah, they wanted him to have the highest education as a Pharisee. And so they would probably would have, well, not probably. They did obviously send him to Jerusalem uh, to be schooled under Gamaliel. And so I have I have my my Bible opened here to open up a, a comment that I have here for Gamaliel. Uh, most of this is kind of, I got this off of, uh, of uh, oh, oh, I forgot to, Wikipedia. And you can't take everything you get off of Wikipedia, but you can actually, it's open to the public to go in and edit stuff that's maybe not correct or whatever. But anyway, this is uh Gamaliel, the elder, and uh, we can uh, they give the different uh, Hebrew pronunciations and stuff like that. Uh, so he was a leading authority in the Sanhedrin in the early first century. And he was the son of, of, um, of Simeon ben Hillel and the grandson of the great teacher Hillel the elder. Yeah, that's right. That Hillel. He's Hillel's grandson. And then uh, the Talmud tells us that uh, Gamaliel was described as bearing the titles of Nasi, or Nas Nasi, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Nasi, uh, which is prince or president, and Rabban our, is a uh, master. So as president of the Sanhedrin Jerusalem, all those, there are some people that dispute that. Um, he definitely held a senior position in the highest court of Jerusalem, being the Sanhedrin. And Gamaliel holds a reputation in the midst of for being one of the greatest teachers in all the annals of Judaism. Since Rabbi Gamaliel the elder died, there has been no more evidence for the law, no more reverence for the law and purity and piety died out at the same time. 
and Gamaliel's authority on questions of religious laws suggested by two Mishniac, Mishniac anecdotes in which the king and queen ask for his advice about rituals and the identity of the king and the queen is in question. It's not given, but it's generally thought to be either Herod of Agrippa and his wife, uh, Cyprus, or Herod Agrippa II and his sister, Bernice, which is, you know, considering the time period and everything, that it would be the latter. And according to the pulpit, pulpit commentary, he was president of the Sanhedrin for some time. And then in uh, Unger's Bible, Dictionary reveals that Gamaliel was given the honorary title of Rabban, which only seven doctors of the law had ever received. He was known for his wisdom and was called the beauty of the law. When he died, some said that the glory of the law had departed. So to continue, we um, Acts 9 records one of the greatest events in all of human history and let's go there and why do i say that well because the one thing it's the greatest conversion story in the history of the world when you think about it it's also great because luke mentions it three times I mean, you'd think mentioning somebody's conversion story would be enough, but no, it's mentioned three times, uh, again in chapter 22 and again in 26, and you get more details every time it's, it's repeated. And it's one of the greatest events because his explanation of the gospel is criti critical to the church's great commission. You see, Christ came primarily to be the gospel, but he chose Paul to explain the gospel. And because of the impact his gospel would have, Jesus wanted to make sure that there was sufficient evidence for everyone who heard it. Everyone who met Paul would uh, certainly have sufficient evidence that God had indeed chosen him to be his vessel to give the gospel to the world first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And that Paul's revelation of Jesus was like no one else physically and spiritually. Now Acts 9 gives us an outward physical account, but we have to look at other passages in the scriptures to see how Paul himself tells you what was going on spiritually to get an inside account of what was going on inside but jesus wanted to know wanted everybody to know that uh, as paul would say in galatians six seventeen, i bear in my body the marks of the lord jesus christ and there's been different speculations about well what is it well obviously we know he was beaten but as but, but that wouldn't necessarily give evidence that Christ had chosen him. So I personally b believe that the evidence of the marks in his body had to do with his eyesight. And Galatians 6.17, which I made reference to, let's look at Galatians 4. And uh, let's look at verse 13. He's telling the Galatians, you know how through an infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you first. In my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. So I believe that that is a reference to that event that wherever he went, he had this problem in his flesh, this weakness, and he prayed three times for God to take it away. And God's responsible, uh, Christ's response to him was, no, sorry, my grace is sufficient for you. 
So let's look at the, uh, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to uh, chapter nine. And uh, it's important to look at chapter nine against the backdrop of what we already know about Paul. Now, if I were naming this chapter, you know how some Bibles, they give you a little heading of different chapters and divisions and stuff like that. I would call this one blinded by the light. And if I were to give it a subtitle, I would use the very words that uh, Paul himself would have used. It says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness have shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So blinded by the light, what light? Was the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That would be the, the subtitle I would give it. And uh, it's ironic that Paul is responsible for spreading the gospel even before he gets the gospel and starts spreading it himself because we find out that uh, earlier on, after the stoning of Stephen, persecution broke out and it just spread. The, the, the disciples just went all over the place. And so the gospel spread everywhere. And up to the point, up to this point, he's uh, he's at the top of his game. And uh, it says here, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And let's go back and look at this, this word breathing out threatenings. When you look at this word, uh, look at this word in the Greek, uh, it's the idea of it is to inhale, to be animated by, bent upon, breathe, breathe out, to breathe in or on, to inhale. So he's really, in other words, this word means it became his life's breath to eradicate believers. At this point in time, Saul is like the dragon's breath. He's Satan's right-hand man, as in Revelation 12, 3. Revelation 12, 3 tells us, and I, I see a parallel here when it says breathing out threatenings. And this is at the early, at the very beginning. It says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into out into the earth, he persecuted the woman that had brought forth the man-child. And so this is not referring to right after Jesus was born, but this is referring to after Jesus was born and ascended into heaven. He's, uh, he's persecuting the woman. So this is early on, right at the very beginning. And clearly, Paul is being used by Satan as his right-hand man, as it were. And this verse also describes um, birth as a likeness. Uh, the birth of the church is a likeness to Jesus and their characters. Uh, the church early on is reproducing the character of Christ in their in their in the way in their actions and their demeanor, and you can get that idea here from John sixteen twenty one. Jesus says, before he leaves, he he kind of prophesies of this event. He says, a woman when she is in travail has sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remember, remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So that's the text I would use to show you that uh, that passage in Revelation is referring to the church, early church, as it's spreading out the gospel, reflecting the character of Christ. And it said they desired of him. Uh, letters uh, from Damascus uh, to go to Damascus. So he's, he's getting the highest authority from the, uh, the chief priest and everyone to basically go out there and bring back whoever. So he has the authority. 
And as he journeyed, verse three, as he journeyed, he came nearer Damascus and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it must be told thee what thou must do. So it's interesting, this light that shone around him, from Acts 22, 6, we learned that this is at high noon. So this light at high noon is so intense. I mean, you know, high noon sunlight is really intense, especially over there in the Middle East, which is, you know, pretty much close to being a tropical country. In fact, when we went over there we uh, to Israel, Denise and I, we saw banana groves everywhere. So, and in the tropics, we lived in the tropics for several years. And, and, and in the noonday, the sun is really intense. And yet this light is so intense, brighter than the noonday sun. And he's totally enveloped in a revelation of Jesus Christ. And notice this light is from heaven. So it's obviously the Lord himself, the the glorified Lord himself that's creating this brightness. And he fell to the earth and a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Now, whenever you have uh, uh, a, a word repeated twice or someone's name repeated twice, it's really trying to get their attention, but it's also a warning, you know, like uh, Mary, Mary. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Or, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stonest the prophets and those who are sent to you. So he's definitely got his attention and uh, says, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And why do you think Jesus is saying this? Let's. Let's, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Why are you persecuting me? Jesus is not even on earth, right? He's, he's ascended back to heaven, and yet he's saying, hey, you're persecuting me. Any comments, any thoughts before I share my comments? Go ahead. Isn't it similar to, um, isn't it similar to uh, that, uh, you know, you who did this to the least of them did it to me. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was my first reference here in, in the quote that I put in my uh, in my uh, Bible. So, in other words, Jesus is saying he's completely identified Jesus. with the members of his body. So when you uh, stub your toe, you. your whole body <laughs> sympathizes. <laughs> The hand doesn't say to your toe, I'm not going to touch you, you're dirty, you know. No, the, the head says to the hand, grab the toe. Gordon, we seem to be getting an echo, I think, maybe from Denise's or something. Denise, were you making a comment at the same time I was? I think she was just unmuted and it was echoing. I had I unmuted. Un I huh. accidentally unmuted. Oh, oh okay. It's because I'm using the speaker from the TV. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's where the feedback. So you switch now to your laptop then, huh? Yeah, I think if you keep it on your laptop, you shouldn't. No, I just out. unmuted. Oh, well, then why am I hearing you? I can't hear if I have it on my laptop. Oh. If I unmute, you hear oh. me. Right, because our speakers are. We hear you. Okay, and also uh, Romans fifteen three tells us the repro reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Uh, so, back to that. Maybe you didn't hear the comment that I was saying about Jesus, how he's 
identified with every member of the body. And I gave the illusion that uh, when you stub your toe, uh, the whole body sympathizes. The, the hand doesn't say to the toe, I'm not going to massage you or try to you know, relieve that pain. No, the head says to the hand, grab the toe, <laughs> you know? So, and the thing is, this is at the heart of sin. Our lamb continually takes all the blows, all the murders, which is at the root of every sin, no matter how small to us it may seem. So, Jesus takes, and, and another thing that tells me that Jesus identifies with everything, every sin, no matter how small it is. In the sanctuary system, regardless of how small the sin was, you would take a lamb and what would you have to do? Take a knife and slit its throat. And in Revelation, when we see there's a lamb in the midst of the throne, the idea there in the language is not that it was slain a long time ago, but that it was presently, freshly being slain. Right now, Jesus is bearing the sins of the world continually. Yes, he's not paying the price of separation, but the pain, and he remembers the, the bitterness, the Bible tells us, remembering the bitterness and the gall. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And it says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard to kick against the pricks. Uh, some translations say goads. It's that tool, that instrument that was sharp and pointed that would use to pierce an oxen's hide to get him to go in the direction you wanted him to go. And he trembling and astonishment said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So I have a note here that somewhere between verses four and six, Saul is converted. He first acknowledges the Lord out of fear because he doesn't really know who he is. That's what I think. But the second time it's out of genuine conviction and appreciation because he realizes that he should be dead. But be assured, the process of his conversion started long before when he was kicking against the pricks, meaning he knew the basics of the gospel because that's what he was fighting against. And that's what made him an effective tool against the gospel. But he did it because he thought it was, it was heresy. So any, any comments, any... Uh, thoughts that because you know there's a lot of people who look at this and say well wait a minute how could this be his conversion i mean there's no i, I don't see any repentance here he's not repenting he's not asking for forgiveness uh you know some people some uh critics some liberal theologians will say well you know it was it was just it was high noon it was hot and you know, he, he was thirsty and uh, he was just having hallucinations. But he asked the Lord what he should do. What must yeah. I do? Yeah. yeah. Lord, he's calling, he's calling him Lord. Paul, yeah. Paul was a very single-minded person. That's how come he persecuted him. But as soon as he realized the truth of it, then he was able to just turn immediately, you know because uh, he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. Yeah, absolutely. And some, some uh, one of the popular theories is that, well, he had, uh, he had, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, epilepsy. He had an epileptic seizure. It's like, oh, please, come on, man. He said, <laughs> if he's having a seizure, you're not going to be saying, Lord, what will you have me to do, <laughs> you know? He's carrying on an intelligible conversation. Also, he has scales fall off his eyes later on. So, I mean, that wouldn't happen if it was just an epileptic seizure. <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh, 
the fact that he was trembling and astonished and then says, what will you have me do? Yes. Okay. It so says there's a deep awareness. I mean, as you said, it's, there's this deep awareness that he should be dead. Yeah. And, and he's so, not. Yeah. So I have a, I have a note here on, on trembling and astonishment. And um, as you well pointed out, he's broken. He's realized now without a doubt, all the murderous actions had been done against Jesus himself. And yet he's being shown mercy. This is outrageous mercy and grace. It was such a miraculous, radical, abrupt event that terminated the direction of his life that he likens it to an abortion. That's the idea in the Greek in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9. Uh, maybe we should look at that if you think otherwise. It says, uh, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Born out of due time. That word in the Greek is a miscarriage, abortion, by analogy, untimely birth, born out of due time. An abortion, abortive birth, an untimely abort birth. So in other words, he's headed in one direction and uh, God is totally aborting that direction. And he continues, for I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This idea of uh, of being the least, he says, uh, a person born before they're ready is small and not the proper size compared to a normal birth. Paul considered himself the least of apostles, the smallest. In fact, Paul, the meaning of the word Paul means little or small. And I believe this is probably the name he gave to himself. And he probably said, hey, just call me Paul. Paul, because I am not to be desired. That's what the word Saul means, desired. And yet Jesus desired this blasphemer and murder, the chief of sinners, and paid an infinite price to now enlist him in the Lord's army. So can you imagine the fury of Satan? Now he's, here he is, he's, he's Satan's right-hand man, and Jesus just intervenes and just turns him in an about face. So this here, it's it's Luke's external account, but then of Saul's conversion, we have to look at something else, Paul's own account of what happened. And we get some insights here from uh, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. And could somebody look up uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 16? My apologies for doing the King James Version because all my notes are in the King James Version, and that's what I've studied my whole life, so I'm comfortable with it. But oftentimes, as I'm studying, I will refer to other versions, um, but it's just because I've had the uh, King James Version with the Strongs. And uh, like I said, it's where all my notes are at. Okay. I'll do it. So you wanted Philippians. Wait, oh. Philippians 3, 7 to 13. I mean, 7 to 16. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith. in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. 
I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. All right. That's one of my favorite passages. Um, Acts talks a lot about the resurrection and here Paul gives it a spiritual application where he says, I want to be totally dead so that Christ can be living in me, resurrected in this mortal body of mine. That's that's what he's that's what he's pressing on. That's what he's his goal is. And in 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. How be it, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all the long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this is another reason why his conversion was so important. God wanted to make sure that it's radical, it's dramatic, it's like no one else's. And here Paul says it was to be an example. In what way was it an example to others? Could I have a comment? On verse 16, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. In what way was Jesus used Paul, did it in this dramatic way, and the person that he used to set an example to everyone else who would believe? When you read about Paul's conversion, when you read about against the backdrop of what we know before, his life beforehand, does it give you hope or does it give you discouragement? Well, I'll, I'll never, I'll never rise to, uh, you know, God can't, you know, I've done so much that I'll never be worth anything and God will never choose me. And that's what Paul says. He says, I'm the chief of all sinners. And yet, and yet what did God do? showed him outrageous grace and mercy. So never think for one moment that, oh, my sin is too great. I'm, I'm, I'm just way too wicked. And I've done all. No, no. Jesus is setting Paul forward as an example that his hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. And so his conversion is an example and an encouragement to all of us. So don't let the, the enemy discourage you. And uh, what wilt thou have me to do? This is also a, a test or an evidence of true conversion. Because one of the first things a converted person does is submit to his new Lord. It's genuine truth of transformation. Before conversion, we are our own Lord, which is a deception of the Lord of this world since we are slaves to the law of sin and death. We don't make Jesus Lord. He's already Lord. He's Lord of all, according to Acts 10 and 32. But he's the Lord, the kind of Lord who wants willing submission. Force is totally alien to his kingdom. And he's just like David. He's like, a, like David, who was a man after God's own heart. David said, David didn't want to become king when he was fleeing. 
says, no, I'm not going to come back until the people want me as king. And just like our Lord, he does not want compulsion or frill or force. He wants willing submission out of a grateful heart. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So we get some uh, further insights in, in Acts 22, 9. The voice they heard was similar to that in John 12, 29, where it says, The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. So they uh, saw. Yeah, go ahead. It sounds to me like if um, Paul was having an epileptic episode, that the people around him were a part of it then, if they heard <laughs> his voice. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. And they're they're all, apparently they're all having epileptic seizures because it says that they uh, they all fell to the ground in another place. I don't think it's. Yeah. Yeah, I well, don't I think, think it, to it, redefine it, epilepsy as being something you can catch then. Yeah, exactly. But they're not seeing, but they're seeing no man. So the question is, did Paul see Jesus? Well, yeah. Yeah. Acts 9, 17. And, I, and Ananias were uh, kind of skipping ahead a little bit. Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest. So Ananias <laughs> apparently got word from Jesus that, look, I appeared, told Ananias, I appeared to Saul. And Saul and Ananias is relating that to uh, Saul. And it's interesting, this phrase here, appeared to thee in the way. I have a quote here that one of my favorite quotes here from uh, the pen of inspiration. It says, infinite love has cast up a pathway upon which the ransomed of the Lord may pass from earth to heaven. That path is the son of God. Angel guides are sent to direct our erring feet. Heaven's glorious ladder is let down in every man's path, barring his way to vice and folly. He must trample on upon a crucified redeemer ere he can pass onward to a life of sin. Our heavenly father's voice is calling us, come up higher. The tokens of his love are as numerous as the sand upon the seashore. The humble trusting ones are guided and protected in the way of peace. But he who is infinite in wisdom compels none to accept heaven's most precious gift, compels none to walk in the path which has been cast up at such cost. Everyone is permitted to choose for himself the narrow shining steep that leads to heaven or that broader and easier way which ends in death. So I like that heaven's glorious ladder is let down in every man's path, barring his way to vice and folly. And so here, Saul again is a pattern of that very thing. Standing in his path, standing in his way, and just setting him in the opposite direction. So did Paul actually see Jesus or did he get just see the light that blinded him? Yeah. Yeah. What was from Ananias? The Lord appeared to him. Right. The light yeah. be the Lord appearing. Yeah, he's I believe he definitely saw Jesus. Anybody anybody else's comments on that? Well, you know, it could be like like when the Bible says that no man has seen God at any time, and and yet uh, in the Old Testament we see that 
it says, well, they saw God and they lived and stuff like that. So I believe that he saw Jesus, but I think like Charles said, it could be that he saw the light and they counted that for being Jesus. But I think, I, yeah, okay. I think this is, this is like uh, the contrast. Remember the last, okay, now mind you, he's three days jumping ahead a little bit. He's three days in darkness. What do you think the last thing he sees and the last thing he's rehearsing in his mind, as Jesus says, I'm Jesus whom you persecuting. Don't you think he has that vision of, of Stephen who says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand. I think God. he knows. I think he not only sees Stephen, but he sees Jesus as his last. But that's my personal opinion. There's no way to prove one way or the other. What we all we have is Ananias' um, word that he saw Jesus, and we don't know in which way Ananias used it. I just have the feeling that Paul saw Jesus, and I think that Paul saw Jesus more than once. Um. And it may not be something that either was either documented or, you know, because remember, Paul went out into the desert for three years. And I think that he had some conversations with Jesus there. Well, doesn't yeah. say in, in, in other places that he saw Jesus? Yeah, no. I believe it is. I, yeah. I'm sure if we did a search and I didn't have Tom, time. He saw him. He's either a liar or he's telling the truth. And if we're going to listen to Paul, we better believe he's telling the truth. Or well, Ananias. Well, because he, he saw him. He, he appeared he, to him. Didn't say the light appeared to him. He could definitely have seen Jesus and it appeared as a light to those who witnessed it. Yeah, they, they, they didn't. It says they didn't see any man. Didn't say that Paul didn't see any man. It just says exactly. that the the guys around him didn't see any man. In fact, and they didn't hear the words. But apparently, Paul heard the words. So if he heard the words and they didn't hear the words, and they saw a light, but they didn't see a man, then it only logically concludes that he saw the man, whereas they didn't. Just as he heard the words. Oh, and I'm, I'm sure over the course of time. When Jesus stand before the centurion, you know, and of course, Paul saw him. He knew, you know, being judged and everything. Well, we know that he said that he appeared. He said he appeared also to me as one untimely born. So I don't. I, yeah, I don't. It, it, yeah, it has nothing to do with the light. That's a good point. We had just I, read that. Last I of all, if. I don't know if it's a point of salvation to know whether he actually appeared to Paul or not. All we can do is take Paul's word. That's how I feel. Yeah, when when Paul tells how uh, he was seen of the this he, when he's referring to after the resurrection, he says, "I uh, can't remember that passage." Uh, let me see. Um, maybe it's in this one. Um, Uh, that's, I can't remember the passage where he says, uh, he appeared to the 12. Yeah. Let me, he, appeared he appeared also. 12, and also, let me look at the. He, what I yeah. I, and that's the, the same passage where he says uh, he was born out of like time. Right. As one untimely born. Same. Yeah. At that same passage. Yep. Okay. Oh, no, that's not it. Yeah, we looked at that. What passage was that? Uh, at least, let me see. Wasn't in it? Was in Galatians. I don't know, uh, but you were talking about yeah. abortions. Uh, yes. Uh, let me see. Gonna be in one of my notes here. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, is it Timothy? No, not that one. We're looking for First Corinthians fifteen eight. Oh right. I sometimes okay. uh, first and second Corinthians mixed up with um, Galatians. If we back up, it says uh, he's explaining the gospel died according to the scriptures, verse four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, his brother, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of time. So there it is. He's giving his testimony. I saw him. So all the others saw him after the resurrection in his glorified state. And uh, they saw him probably in his subdued <laughs> glory. I mean, he didn't show all of his glory, but apparently on the road to Damascus, he got a glimpse like even the disciples and the others. Not even they got the same glimpse that Paul got, which was a blinding revelation in all his glory. Well, uh who was it? A Peter and James and John or who did see him glorified with Moses and Elijah. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Everyone yeah, say something. I just said the others saw him before he um, went up, you know, before he was uh, one that ascended. Yeah, before he ascended. Ascended. There you go. That's the word. When does uh, when does Paul go to the third heaven? Pardon, I didn't catch that. When does Paul go to the third heaven? Where where does Paul report that uh, he went to the third? Yeah, heaven? he's. Yeah, that's. We could. We could. Uh, let's see. I can do a search on that if anybody doesn't know it right offhand. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above, above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to other. Of such a one will I glory, yet I myself, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. So do we know whether... This was on the road to Damascus or not? No, we don't know, but it could be he, he had so many revelations. Remember, he he went into the desert and spent three and a half years being personally tutored by Christ to make up for, you know, even, you know, the other apostles spent three and a half years. So. Jesus is going to spend three and a half years personally tutoring him. And so what's an advantage for him is that while the other disciples, you know, they weren't even converted yet. And Jesus, and they're just really dull of hearing. And they're not, all the things that Jesus said himself, many things I want to tell you, but you're just not able to bear them. But when you're told, Peter, when you're converted, go strengthen your brethren. And that was toward the end. So, uh, with Paul, he's got an advantage in that he gets three and a half tutoring, uh, three and a half years of tutoring right from the get go after his conversion. Is that from Mrs. White? Uh, no, that's we learn about that from uh, Galatians. Okay. 
when he's uh, telling the Galatians, he's having to, he kind of, when he goes to the Galatians, he basically rehearses his history and mm -hmm. tells, look, <laughs> I didn't receive my gospel from anyone. I didn't consult with flesh and blood, you know, and, and then he got a vision that he needed to go up to Jerusalem because the church was in danger of going back to legalism. And that's why he relates that whole scenario in Acts 15, which we'll come to later. But let's uh, not get too sidetracked here. And he says, uh, says in verse 9, and he was three days without, without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. So here he is, three days. He's without sight. What kind of, what kind of without sight do you think he might have had? You think it was uh, the kind of site where everything's blackness, or could it be a different kind of without sight? Anybody have some thoughts on that? I think it could have been a different kind. And why do you say that? Well, first of all, you can go without water for a day when you're fasting, but Three days is really uh, very difficult. I mean, it's a lot easier for you to die without water than it is without food. And secondly, I think part of that could have been because he was so busy with the Lord during that time. It doesn't say that. Amen. I'm not saying that it is that. I'm just... Not I'm, only... I'm, huh? I'm sorry? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just, Not only is he busy with the Lord, communing with the Lord, but do you think that uh, do you think that Satan is like, oh well, you win some and you lose some? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, what sure. Do think, <laughs> what do you think Satan was doing during those three days? Oh my lands, I, I think he was trying to kill him. You imagine the temptation and the and because remember when Satan loses. A follower what does he do doesn't he try to overwhelm them with the discouragement and oh, despair yeah. you're not good enough god can't accept you here you're, you're beyond hope look what you've done you know and he would bring up his past and tell oh, him he was hallucinating yeah, exactly he didn't happen. You can imagine all the things yeah Well, I mean, maybe, maybe his mind was was with Jesus, the ascended Jesus, who was yep. not not of this world, and so he wasn't seeing the things of this world. I mean, maybe it was like uh, looking into the sun, and that afterwards you feel blinded for some period of time. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it was like that. Yeah, and I think instead instead of seeing blackness, probably all he could see was bright light. Like I was saying earlier, I don't have any proof for what I think may have been happening, but I think um, he was so busy and so so awed by what was happening, mm -hmm. both by what happened and what was happening to him. That it wasn't a choice of, oh, now I'm going to fast for three days because I've been bad and now I'm I'm starting a new life. I think it was because he was really busy taking care oh, of Oh, yeah. Him. In other words, there wasn't anything. Food, water probably never even entered his mind. He was exactly. so consumed with what was going on. There's, uh, oh. here's some of the, here's one of my, my notes I'd like to read here. It says... Uh, of course, I mentioned this, you know, you think Satan said, oh, well, you win some, you lose some. No doubt a struggle ensued. All the ramifications were heaped on him. Imagine he may have thought, I'll lose everything. I'll have so many enemies that will want to kill me. I'm friendless. Will Christians even trust me? But Jesus, true to his word, never left him nor forsook him. 
And during these three days, as he supped with the Lord, he decided all he was and all his accomplishments were dung compared to the love, grace, and mercy shown to him by his Messiah, friend, and Savior, and now Lord. So he was victorious. I think he was going through some real agony there. He was... Oh, yeah. Satan you would know. press upon him this tremendous weight of guilt. Yeah. I mean, agony and ecstasy at the same time because of discovering who God really is and who Jesus really is. I mean, that, I don't know about you guys, but it blows my mind. Oh, yeah. To... And, and, and isn't that the experience of conversion? Don't, when we come, when God brings us to repentance, isn't it his goodness? that brings yeah. us to repentance. And so we're agonizing. We're so sorry. And yet the peace and the joy at the same time that the Holy Spirit gives. I Absolutely. mean, the Holy Spirit's work is to convince of sin. And yet he's called the comforter. That's the irony. That's the, that's the contrast, the contradiction, how we can see, feel so remorseful. And yet at the same time, have such peace. Because it's a peace that passes all understanding. And it's something that people can't understand because it is past understanding. And only those who have experienced it can relate to each other who have. And that's the beauty of being a part of the body of Christ. And that's what lends to our fellowship one with another. Because we can share this thing that we have in common, this peace and this joy that the world cannot see. Yeah. And so I, let's go ahead. I have a story sometime that I can tell you about that, but maybe this is not the right time. Okay, and I see it's already past seven. Let's let's continue. Um, it says, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and he said to him, said and and to him said the lord in a vision ananias and he said behold i am here lord and the lord said unto him arise and go into the street which is called straight and inquire in the house of judas for one called saul of tarsus for behold he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight then ananias answered lord i have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So to put it in a modern language, it's like, you know, if I were Ananias, I'd be saying, Lord, I, I don't think you've been reading the latest newspapers, the Jerusalem Post or whatever. I mean, you haven't been watching TV. This guy's terrible look at everything he's done but what is god's response but the lord said unto him go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the gentiles and kings and children of israel for i will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake and ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother saul the lord even jesus that appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, have sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound into the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying, laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by the night 
and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydia. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydia and, and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was a, at Joppa a certain disciple named Tab Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto, they sent unto him two men desire him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. Sorry, I rushed through the last part of there just to get through uh, chapter nine. But if I, we I, go back to verse 27, Barnabas is answering the very question we asked a few minutes ago. Okay, go ahead. Verse 27, but yeah. Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples and declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the way. Yep. So Barnabas is saying he saw the Lord on the way and had yep. spoken to him. Yep. yep. So that was answering the question we were asking just a few minutes ago. Right. So you have Barnabas' testimony, Ananias' testimony, and Paul's own testimony, and and the context of of Acts. And probably later on we'll we'll, we'll probably uh, see some more evidence in those other two accounts. I uh, totally but, about that um, uh, about what Barnabas had said. But I have an interest, I have a question that interests me, and that is, remember when Ananias was told to go to uh, the straight street and, and go to the house of, was it Judah? Judah? Uh, let's go back and let's see. Go to the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul. Judas, Yeah. I'm wondering what relationship Judas would have had to Paul because everybody was scared of him. Was this a friend of his? Was this somebody who was, you know what I'm asking? Was he, you know, uh, sympathetic to, to Paul or to the Christians? Or, I mean, what, what was going on with that guy? Yeah, a good, good question. Let's see if there's any clues in the uh, in the the name itself. The name of ten Israelites also the posterity of one of them and its region. That doesn't tell us anything. Uh, uh, it's possible since the soldiers with him had to take him by hand and lead him. Possibly there was 
a believing guard with him, sort uh -huh. of undercover, uh, and took him home. That, that, that surprised me in the early church. That would be lovely, wouldn't it? Or could it be that um, Judas didn't really know what yeah, Ananias was doing to take the scales off of Paul's? That eye. probably God is probably going to try to kill several birds with one stone, uh, to use the phrase. <laughs> it, could I also, it could also have been somebody he knew. He's from Tarsus. Was he going to Tarsus? No, no, he was going to Damascus. Oh, Damascus. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, in Damascus was a there was a lot of Hellenistic Jews in Damascus, and that was the very reason he was going to Damascus, because Stephen was making such inroads in the Hellenistic community, and uh, and uh, Stephen's arguments were, you know, that Jesus was the Messiah, were just spreading all over in, in the Hellenistic territories, and and Damascus was quite a stronghold so he decided hey i'm gonna go and do the heart of the beast i'm gonna go where it's it's just getting totally out of control there with these people of the way and i'm gonna utterly stamp them out so yeah i i, I believe that probably like uh one of you said that it's probably one of his you know temple guards probably the the entourage he's you know, to be able to rest people and bring them back to Jerusalem, he has to have quite an entourage with him. You know, and these are probably uh, uh, the temple police, uh, you know, who are totally in agreement with what Saul's doing, and and they all have the authority to do this. And so they're probably taking him uh, basically to their own lair, so to speak. And then here comes Ananias right in the middle of it, and probably all these others who are unbelievers are standing by to see what is going to happen and to see this testimony. And no doubt Paul is going to share with them his conversion. <laughs> you, uh, you know, in Egypt, right? When the Israelites were being led, the, I'm thinking of the pillar of fire. What do you think the pillar of fire was? It's Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, the it's Lord, kind of. the Lord Himself before His, before His uh, incarnation, how He appeared over and over. It was never the Father appearing. We have to understand that because no man has seen God the Father at any time. Okay, but Christ is the express image of His person. So if you've seen Him. It's the equivalent of seeing the Father, but Jesus is the one mediator between God, the Father, and man. And so all those manifestations are the Lord Jesus himself prior to his incarnation. And I'm, I'm assuming that the light would, a big enough candle to light up the whole camp. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so the gospel, Paul will tell us in uh, Romans chapter 10, that the gospel was preached to them as well as us. How was it preached to them? Through the sanctuary system and through all the their wanderings, the water from the rock, the cloud, the, the parting of the Red Sea, which is a type or a pattern of, of, of the second death, you know. Uh, all those things were patterns I, and illustrations. I was going to say in 1 Corinthians 4, it says, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. Okay. There is no more comments or anything. We'll... Uh, We'll go ahead and close with prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for your scriptures. We thank you for the revelation that you gave to your apostle Paul so that it will give us a tremendous amount of encouragement. 
And we thank you that so much of the New Testament was written by him because he had so much knowledge that you had given him to tell to us. And you made sure that he was in prison so much that he would write these letters because you were thinking of us in our day at the very end. So we'd have this encouragement and this instruction in the plan of salvation because he explained it like no other. And so to this end, Father, help us to be able to understand the things that he's written, understand more fully. As he said many times, to grow in the grace and knowledge because it was the knowledge of you, a personal, intimate knowledge of you that caused him to count everything that he considered meritorious, nothing but dumb. And so we want to have that same glimpse, that same knowledge, Father, that will cause this world to be, to us, blindness, darkness, that we can't see anything other than your glory, your glory as the express image of the Father. And we want this treasure in our earthen vessels, our own bodies, our own temple, own bodily temple, so that it will be evident. As he says in 2 Corinthians 4, to prove that this all-surpassing glory is from God, from you, and not from us. And to this end, Father, we thank you and praise you. In your son's wonderful name.